This is our recording of our lockdown Zoom session, um, and I'll be starting with a presentation and then we'll be doing practice. Uh, the focus of the session is a portrait, and uh, the presentation is a kind of a broad look at some portraits through the history of, of art, of um, culture, if you like. Um, and the practice will be based on the idea of portrait using um, pencil for the first one and then ink um, and some some applicators that we're going to make but I'll show you how to do that when we get to that stage of it. So I'm just going to share my screen and I will take you through the presentation before we get to the practice. So portraits, um, you know, so the idea of portraiture goes back a long way. So I, I quite like to start these um, uh, presentations with a, a bit of history and I've gone back as far as I've, I've ever been in these things. Uh, to that, which is called the Magapascat pebble. Um, and it's uh, two and a half million years old. And there's a lot of uh, sort of discussion about there's some discussion about it. It comes from Africa, from the sort of uh, cradle of, um, of humanity, if you like. Uh, but it's two and a half million years old. It's long before there was, there were humans around. It, it was um, um, when it was mostly uh, primates, early early ancestors. Um, and this, this, this pebble was found in, in a cave where these uh, primates lived. Okay, and the, the, the suggestion is not that it was made by by made there. And um, the idea is that it was brought it brought there by by this uh, primate that recognised a face. Okay, the pebble is made of jasperite, and the jasperite is not found in in the cave where where the, the object was found. It's not. It doesn't come from that area. So the, one of the, the theories about it is that it, it was, the face was recognized um, as that by the primate, and so it was, it was gathered and taken back. The marks on it are not made by hand. The marks on it are made uh, randomly by accident. They, they were able to kind of uh, decipher that or think they have understood that. Um, so the, the idea behind it, behind its popularity and, and uh, position is that it was recognized as a face by uh, a primate. Um, and gathered for that reason. So that it's interesting that that idea is the idea that faces who we are and what we are is is hardwired into our makeup, into our DNA, into into our consciousness, um, and that's sort of what the the idea of this pebble um, illustrates uh, from from two and a half million years ago. Um, the next slide is that one, which are uh, the hands I've talked about before. The hands um, are from the cave in Altamira in Spain, um, where obviously they're not a face, but they're the hands of what, what are thought to be the artists, the people who left the, the drawings of the, 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 the animals and, and the wildlife on the, on the Altamira cave wall. And it's really the, the idea is that the people are saying, here I am. So it's a kind of uh, evidence of, of a presence, which is obviously what a portrait is. So it's, a, it's, it's an early idea of people leaving their mark and saying, I was here. A, a, a kind of portrait, a kind of a statement of identity. I mean, ultimately, they're about 40,000 years ago, those, those ones. That is Tutankhamun's uh, mask from it's about 1300 BC. And it's, it's one of the things that, a, one of the reasons it stands out is that it's, um, it, it's, it's understood to be a likeness of Tutankhamun. Before that, and indeed after that, they were things were much more stylized. Masks, death masks were much more stylized. The one on the left there is Akhenaten, who is Tutankhamun's father, and his mask is, or that stone stat statue of him, of him, is much more um, stylized in the way that they they they, they render his face, the eyes, the, the the nose, the elongated eyes, elongated nose, that sort of thing. Whereas Tutankhamun, he has people who who write about it suggest that his his mouth, his lips, his top lip which was larger than the bottom lip is shown as evidence. The, the shape of the eyes is much more almond-like rather than the elongated, that sort of thing. So it's understood to be a likeness. The, the stone carving on the right is also Tutankhamun and bears the same characteristics. So it's different from the other, other uh, objects made around that time, which were uh, kind of stylized representations of uh, God figures, if you like. Um, so that's a, a very early likeness uh, being created. Um, that's a, 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 an ancient Greek sculpture of called the Boxer Resting, 300 BC. And I, I, I put it in because it shows a characterization, it shows uh, human emotions, human frailties, if you like. So he's, he's a professional boxer 
who's who's resting after after a fight. And those marks on his face there on the on the picture on the right, they're not the, uh, the patina of time from an old sculpture. They're they're part of the sculpture, showing the scars and the bruises of the of a, of a brutal profession. And so that's a kind of characterization and identity being put into the idea of, of portraiture in ancient Greece. When they, you know, the ancient Greek, Greeks and ancient Romans would show they had uh, likenesses of people. And that's a nice, nice sort of characterization of someone and the, the fragility and the vulnerability of the boxer and the characterization. Those are uh, Fayum mummy portraits from ancient Egypt uh, round about the time of Christ. And they were from the, from the Fayum Valley in, in Egypt, which is apparently dry by Egyptian standards. So very well preserved. None of those portraits have been um, improved, particularly one on the right, which is very well preserved. The, the Romans uh, ruled Egypt at the time. They have a strong resemblance to the kind of thing that was happening in Rome around about that time. They have, have a very Roman feeling to them, if you like. Those, again, are, are a likeness of the person contained within the mummy. It's not an, it's not an idealised or stylized idea of what a human face would be. It's, it's a likeness. And the, the one on the right with the writing, the writing is actually Greek. So you have Egypt being ruled by the ruled by the Romans, but uh, the language that they were using, or one language is used to communicate, was, was Greek. So a big kind of uh, exchange of cultural ideas going on there. But of course, the, the Roman Empire fell in 395 AD, and so then kind of things became a bit more more fractured, and the the art became more um, portraits became more stylized. So you have the idea of the Byzantine Empire. Um, or, or Commonwealth, whichever you want to call it, where um, kind of took over that sort of northern part of Eastern, no, sorry, sorry, part of Eastern Europe, around about the Mediterranean. Um, and then west of that, you get sort of the kind of Gothic sort of ideas. It's, it's um, but they, they have a very similar approach to, to portraiture. There's obviously pictures of Virgin Mary, Byzant Byzantine one on the, on the left, Gothic one on the right, almost exactly the same, uh, stylized, Perhaps because it's it, it's a, it's a divine figure, they didn't want to give it specific characteristics. But the uh, that idea of the, the individual sort of is is difficult to to find in those in those periods, those early Christian periods of art. The Book of Kells is that that uh, manuscript uh, bottom left there, and then there's another one um, um, manuscript bottom right, that again Mary, where they they are stylized figures of people rather than clear characterized uh, portraits of, of individuals. Then you start to get towards the, um, the Reformation, big, big jump towards the Reformation in, in the sort of 13th, 14th century. And those are uh, frescoes by Giotto. Now, although, those, although they're not any really discernible uh, likenesses of, of a person, the Renaissance was sort of looking back again at, at the sort of those ancient Greek Roman ideas in art and, and you're getting characterization through, or you, you get an expression of human emotions, rather like the boxer, the, the people in the, the deposition fresco, the top one uh, of Christ, they're, they're showing emotion. And the same with one the bottom one, it's the death of St. Francis. Uh, the monks are, are showing emotion in, in what they're doing. Whereas before, those sorts of uh, portraits or, or works of art were, were much more um, stylized um, ideas that, that of, of the figures that were being portrayed. So Giotto was, was the, regarded as the first Renaissance artist and stepping back into that idea of characterization. This is a, a, a picture by uh, Botticelli for the Adoration of the Magi, 1475. So a big jump to well into the re Renaissance and showing a, a definite uh, move into characterization. So that you, you have the, the Adoration of the Magi. The Magi are, the three, are three of the Medici family the guy, um, the man leaning, kneeling down in front of the, the baby Jesus was Cosimo Medici and his sons, or grandsons, Piero and Giovanni. Uh, the other two figures, uh, the one in the red cloak and the one beside him, those are the three magi. So they were, they were included in the, in, in the picture. They were portraits of important people painted by Botticelli, who's the figure on the right staring out at us. So the, the idea of the, the, uh, the religious scene, the, the important story within within the church, within the culture, within the society, is kind of hijacked as a means of promoting the important family, the Medici family, and, and the artists also on the right. The, the portrait was painted by, uh, was, was paid for by Gaspari de Zanobi de Lama, 
who is also a Medici, who's the if, if that group of figures on the right, but halfway along the guy, there's a guy in a blue robe sort of partially staring out at us, at us. He, he paid for it. So there are all these portraits going on within an important cultural picture. And it was painted for his funerary cha funeral chapel, Gaspari's funeral chapel, chapel. So, so portraits are being included in these religious paintings as a way of acknowledging the people in them and, and promoting their importance. The, the three Magi were actually dead by the time this portrait was painted. And they were, the family was run by uh, Lorenzo de' Medici, who was a close friend of uh, Botticelli's or a so close associate of Botticelli's. So um, portraits being added into, uh, of, of specific individuals being added into important paintings. That is Jan van Eyck's painting of the marriage of Jan Arnolfini and his wife, 1434. So the Renaissance was taking place in, in Italy and Southern Europe, but there was also a Renaissance in Northern Europe in, in the Flemish school in around about Holland. And this is a picture of a guy getting, being betrothed to, to, to his wife. And it's important for, or well known for a few reasons. One, it's the first, or one of the first oil paintings on board, or one of the earliest existing oil paintings on board that we have. It's a great example of Dutch use of oil paint, which was kind of new around about that time. Um, great rendering of the, the cloth, great immense detail that the, that the oil paint allowed you uh, to, to show um, in, in your work. And, the, and one of the things that people always point to it, out about it is the, is the mirror in the background. So you're seeing the, 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 the mirror is doing a few things which are kind of interesting in terms of con conceptually, the way that people thought about art and painting and what it was doing. So you're seeing the artist, there's a reflection of two people in that mirror, it's a convex mirror. So they're not quite sure, it's not a picture of the art, artist painting, but there's one figure in there that has a, wearing a red hat and Jan van Eyck painted a few self-portraits wearing a red hat. So that sort of thought of as being him. But the other figure they're not sure about. But the other thing that the, the, the mirror does is it kind of breaks the picture plane. So, so the, the artist who's painting it, Daniela Carson standing in the door, are outside, are, are in a sense, our side of the picture plane. So he's playing with that idea as well, which was you know, not, not common. So the, the other thing about it is I've always found it a wee bit creepy. I've always found uh, uh, Jan Arnolfini portrait to be a wee, bit, a wee bit creepy, but that's an entire uh, personal reaction. But that was happening around the same time as, you know, in, in Northern Europe, as, as all these things, as the the Italian Renaissance was going on. Um, I'll come back to that picture when I think of some other things as well. That is the last judgment, the School of Athens, sorry, um, by Raphael, 1509. So I jump on again, and there's a couple of interesting things happening in there. Uh, it's, it's, there's He's using the, 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 it's from the paper apartments in the Vatican. He's using the, 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 Rena the Renaissance idea, this, this looking back at ancient Greece and Rome, the sort of philosophers, uh, ancient Greek philosophers there. And he's contained it within this, within the, and he's, he's using um, a one point perspective, which was relatively new. It was set out, Brunelleschi rediscovered the secret of, of uh, linear perspective. A guy called Alberti put it down in a book called On Painting in 1435. And that's what Raphael is using there to create that great perspective within the painting. But he's including portraits of famous people, people he knew. He's put his own self-portrait on the right, which is rather like the uh, Botticelli thing, that's him staring at us. But the, the central figure there is, is actually Leonardo. And the, the figure in the front of his head and his hands is taken to be Michelangelo. And there are other recognizable figures in there. So once again, the bigger picture being used to um, uh, appropriate it as a way of making portraits of famous people. That is the Michelangelo's last judgment on the wall of the Sistine Chapel. And he famously he had a really bad time painting both the ceiling and the last judgment. And he didn't go on with the Pope, all sorts of stuff going on, politics going on. And he, he didn't enjoy the physical task of it. So it, it's thought that figure, St. Bartholomew holding that sort of flayed uh, skin is Michelangelo. He painted himself in this kind of uh, flayed empty shell from the experience of painting these pictures. So that's him using portrait self-portraiture in that way there on the, the last segment in, in the Vatican. A big jump now to Caravaggio, who's more Baroque, Italian painter, so painting of Bacchus, 1596. Caravaggio was a bit of a party animal, liked to drink. 
paintings like that would, would be painted of Bacchus, the god of wine and, and excess and partying, would be for people's private apartments for their own, own enjoyment. There's a, a couple of things going on in there that are interesting. That, that wee black and white image I've got on the right with the red circle is a, is a wee self-portrait, small self-portrait of Caravaggio in the wine. So Caravaggio, Caravaggio sort of putting himself there, wanted to secrete himself within the painting, but also I think saying, you know, I like a drink. The other, the other thing about that, that sort of still life that's going on there in front of uh, Bacchus, um, or who was the, the Greek god of wine, is that within them there's a couple of apples that are kind of rotting. So you get that the men mental mori idea of the, the transience of life, life and death, that sort of thing, the cycle of life, Caravaggio thing, those ideas. But the, the, the actual figure of Bacchus is, is reckoned to be one of his studio assistants, and he's hiding himself in the wine. That is a, a really nice picture. And I was just looking about for self-portraits of artists, portraits of artists. And I just came across this picture I'd never seen before. It's a paint picture by a woman called Clara Peters, female artist, not so common. Uh, 1615 Flemish is still life and it's really nice just a nice depiction of very simple foods cheese and bread and wine but what I really like about it is that in the uh, that pot at the back that terracotta jug at the back in the, in the pewter lid she's painted a tiny wee self-portrait reflection in the lid which is just a really nice little detail to look out for when you look at that sort of sort of painting and, and she's left her mark her signature uh, probably on the painting uh, but her, her portrait also is a really nice piece of self-portraiture. That's probably one of the most discussed uh, and famous portraits in the history of Western European art. It's, it's uh, Velasquez's Las Meninas, which means the ladies in waiting. So it's the, a, a painting of the Infanta. So the small girl in the middle in the, in the, in the lighter dress is the Infanta, the, the Philip of Spain's daughter. Velasquez was Philip IV's official court painter. So he's painting the Infanta, but there's kind of interesting things going on in that picture. They're looking at us, but, but the painting is not of us. The painting Velasquez is doing, which is the canvas on the left, he's painting a picture of, of, of uh, the king, Philip IV, and his wife, who we see in the mirror standing where we are standing. And the idea is that because the people are looking directly at us, not to the side of us, we are, in the sense, the, the king and the queen. But the other thing about that paint, painting is also that the marriage of Jan Arnolfini and his wife, which I spoke about, was actually in Philip's apartments in Spain. He had that painting, so Velasquez would have seen it and, and understood it, and, and he's using it. So once again, he's breaking the picture plane. He's, he's putting us outside the picture plane. The people in the mirror are outside the picture plane. Although, um, so he's playing with that idea. And the picture he's painting is, is visible in the painting we're seeing, but it's not the painting, he's, the picture that he's painting, if you, if you like. So there's all kinds of ideas going on there. There's the other people in it. There's a, there's a, a chaperone, a, a guard, and some, some other uh, companions for the, for the, for the Infanta. And the guy at the back is, the, is, a, is um, a courtier of some sort. I can't remember what he is exactly. But it, it, it's a really interesting picture. The, the artist making the statement of how important he is at the court. It's a portrait of him. With the with the, the king in it, so it's a really interesting making of a, of a portrait and self-portrait and discussion or or um, illustration of all, lots of ideas around making a painting and, and making a portrait that can go on forever. Um, so worth a look. That's a, a painting by a woman called uh, Sofonisba Anguis Anguisala, and she was a, a, a well-known, successful painter in Italy in the 16th century, that was made 1550. And I put it in, I was looking for more pictures of and, and by women. Um, and I came across this one as an artist I didn't know about. Uh, she was uh, the first recorded woman to have an apprenticeship to an artist. And she became a very successful uh, painter, became Philip II's court painter. It's called a self-portrait with Bernardino. So it's a, she painted the picture of someone else painting a picture of her which is a kind of interesting little, little play with she's once again like the previous one playing with this idea of how you how you render images of people and she's saying i'm important enough to be painted by this guy as the as the portrait painter it's a really nice picture also I, and i did, had never come across her before i looked for, for this presentation uh, artemisia gentileschi uh, 16th century or 16th 17th century um, italian painter 
who had been uh, apprenticed to her father. Her father was a, was a well-known painter uh, in Europe and she became apprenticed and became very famous in her, in her own right, which was like um, the previous artist, it was very unusual in those days. Not unheard of, but unusual. And that, that painting there is a, 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 a self-portrait as the allegory of art or of, of painting. And there's one of the interesting things about it is that the allegory of painting had been set out in a book. You know, these things were not random. They, they kind of put uh, rules to these ideas. And the, the allegory of painting did a, did a few things. Um, one, the allegory of painting was, was, was a woman. The other thing was the allegory of painting wore this, that little brooch uh, or mask around its neck because uh, painting uh, was, um, it was about um, putting a mask on things. It was about creating a drama, a, a, a narrative in a similar way to um, ancient Greek ancient Roman ideas of, of theatre. But the, the interesting thing about it is that traditionally the allegory of painting would wear a, a gag uh, because painting was silent. And she doesn't put a, a gag on herself. She says, I'm not going to be silent. She, so she was making a bit of a statement about being, um, you know, not wanting to be a silent woman in a man's world. And she became a bit of a sort of feminist icon a while back. And she's fairly well known now, and there's a big exhibition of her work in London recently. A lot of her work has a reference to that idea of, of a, a, a woman in a man's world railing against the sexism. I and mean, you find when you read about her and look at the paintings, there's a lot of references to those ideas. So Artemisia Gentileschi, very, very interesting artist. And that is a painting by Henry Rayburn which is in Kelvin Grove Art Gallery in Glasgow, which I have looked at a lot and I, and, I, and I quite like. And I like it for the way it's painted. It's painted, painted very, very, very loosely, very broad brush. It, it's, it's nice, it's a huge painting. It's got this enormous gold frame around it. And if you can get past the, the gilt gold, gold frame, it's a really nice painting. A picture of Mr. And Mrs. Robert M. Campbell of Keilty, a sort of strolling through their country park. And it's, it has a kind of a, an, an, an ordinariness about it, a, uh, they seem like very approachable people in, in, in some ways. And there's no grandness, I guess, to, to the way they're presenting themselves, as, as though they've been come across, someone's come across them as they walk through the, through the park. And I, I like that painting. I like uh, Rayburn's paintings in general. I like the way he paints, he use, the way he uses the paint. But I was, when I was doing research, but research for this, I was, I, I'll, I'll never be able to look at it in the same way again, because like a lot of those sort of um, things from that period of, of, of wealth and uh, particularly in, in British culture, they're based on slavery. Mr. And, uh, Robert and Cal Campbell had 232 slaves in the West Indies and his wealth came from there. So it doesn't quite have the same meaning for me anymore. I don't know if the gallery has put any reference to that uh, on next to the painting. And, and the painting, I guess, itself commissioned by him would be paid for, but with this, the same kind of money made, made from slavery. So it's a painting that I um, have liked in the past, but I won't look at the same again having understood that information. And I guess that is uh, how, how our appreciation of art, our understanding of art and culture changes over time as it does. It changes the, the more understandings that we have. And that's an example of that. Those are two portraits by the one on the left, Cezanne, and the one on the right, Matisse, both of their wives. So the one of, of Cezanne's wife, Hortense, painted in the, what they think of is the glass house of, their, of, the, of, of where they live. They spent a lot, of the, a lot of their lives apart and, and his family never really accepted her. Cezanne's kind of central idea of his art was that everything is based on the sphere, cone and cube. And he was a big in, in, inspiration for, for the cubists. It's something I've never been entirely comfortable with, but he is the, the, idea, the, the sphere, cone, cube thing. His, his big thing was to, to, to work from life, to work from nature. And he's in, in that portrait, he's using the portrait as a motif through which to uh, investigate the ideas that he is, that are at the heart of his art. Um, the, the, the form, the rendition of form, the simple rendition of form um, and working from life. Uh, whereas before, and, and he's not the first art, artist to do that, but uh, the, the art of the academies was, was very formulaic and, and uh, he was re reacting against that, but using the portrait as a motif through which to investigate his artistic ideas. And the same with Matisse. But that's uh, Matisse's wife, Amelia. Cezanne was painted in 1891, Amelia in 1905. So that was when Matisse was in his fauvist period, when he was using uh, bright colours to, to be like explosives, he said. And it's a portrait of his wife, but he's using that motif, the, the idea of the motif of, of his wife as a way of 
experimenting with and and uh, showing his ideas of art. So the the, the, the portrait uses used as more than a characterization, a motif through which to to experiment with ideas. That's a, a portrait, self-portrait by a guy called Chuck Close, who is um, an American art, contemporary American artist. Or he's, he's using the, the portrait as a way of the face, which is a, a one of the most common motifs within art, Western European art, I should say. So it's a self-portrait, but he's in that one. He is um, ma he's making it from from thousands or probably yeah probably thousands certainly hundreds hundreds of different perspectives. Each little square on that self-portrait. It's a very big painting. They're about eight feet high. Each little square has an, its own little painting, its own little abstract painting within it, and the, and together the abstract paintings kind of stick together as a as a rendering of, of the face. And um, so, same thing. He's using the the face as a, as a motif to to uh, investigate ways of seeing. And um, Chuck Close, contemporary American artist. Uh, that's um, on the right, Picasso. On the left, Joan Eardley. Very expressive portraits. So Joan Eardley's drawings were the, from the of the kids in in Townhead in Glasgow from the 50s and 60s. Uh, very, very expressive. They've got a lot of uh, pathos in them. They're re really uh, kind of beautiful drawings, but quite quite difficult to look at sometimes. And, and Picasso's self-portrait on the right there, that was done about a month before, I think about a month before he died. And it's, I love it. It's, it's, you, you can sense, sense the vulnerability. It's rather like the, the, the sculpture of the boxer that we looked at, it has definite vulnerability in it and it was it was one of the last ones that he did he did a few self portraits that look similar to that but that's the one that first one i came across and i've always liked liked it since i saw it and so the real characterization real real expression real response to the idea of looking at someone and and uh, creating an emotional work from them so portraits can can do that and that's the last slide it's a, a woman called uh, cindy sherman who's an American artist, contemporary. She's a, a photographic artist and she, she makes these, these portraits. They're not exactly self-portraits. They are characters that she assumes. And her work is, looks rather like um, film stills with made up characters in them. And they're kind of partly a critique on America. You know, a look at, a, a look at a women, women's roles uh, with, within America, but not, not only that, but she, has, she assumes characters, she invents characters. Um, and takes portraits of them as a way of looking at mostly Amer modern America. Cindy Sherman, a photographic artist. So that's the um, that's the uh, the pre presentation. We're going to do some practice now. I'll just sort myself out here. So the practice is a couple of things. I'm going to go to my hands uh, so you can see them. So um, what I want to do is a couple of, and they're fairly straightforward. The first one I want to do is a portrait. Oh, so I want to do a couple of portraits. Um, the first one I want to do is based on this photograph um, of Claudia. The, um, so it's a, it's a photograph and there, I, on it I've placed the, these, um, I've sort of quartered it two lines, and that's had to help us to um, to transfer it onto onto another bit of paper. So on the zooms here, we I might have Claudia here in front of you, but she would still be on the screen. So it works just as well to have a photograph, and it's slightly easier to do. So um, what I've done is I've taken a bit of paper and um, quartered it up, set myself organised like that. So you can see the two things. I'll, I'll work on it um, side by side as I always do. But, but before I do that, um, I just want to talk about a couple of things about the face when we look at the face. Um, portraiture is quite a, quite a challenging thing um, to do. And there's a couple of things about faces. Very often people have difficulty with noses. So the no noses and, and nostrils. So noses have, um, in this view, the, there's a width, there's a, there's a plane across the front of the nose. So remember that. Very often people will find the, the, the edge of the nose and then start rendering um, the shadow or, or leave it all light from there rather than acknowledging there's a there's a plane down the front and then a plane at the side. So remember there's a width nose. The other thing is about nostrils. People very often when they're when they're drawing a nostril will um, when they're drawing a nose will you know draw the nose and draw 
a great big nostril like that, uh, is that because they're drawing what they, what they think they see rather than what they're looking at. So just remember that the, when the nose comes down, it's quite shallow, the, uh, the nostril, okay? And the, this, this bit here, the, uh, the, the philtrum, it comes down, that inside line of the, of the, uh, of the nostril there is the line that the filtrum that 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 line comes from, and the same on the other side. So you get these two lines that come down from down from there. The the um, so you get this, and it goes like that. Okay, kind of like oh, you can't see, <laughs> couldn't see what I was doing. Um, okay. So the nose, pencil. Kind of goes like that. So the, the filtrum comes down from the, from there. Um, so that's a couple of things to remember. The, there's, a, there's a width to the front of the nose um, and the, this bit, the, the filtrum comes down from the inside line of the nose. There, like that. Um, the other thing to think about is, is eyes, okay? So um, there's a, because the front face isn't, isn't flat, it kind of, this eye is, is facing more towards us and that eye is, we're seeing more in perspective, okay? So this one is, is very much, a, you know, the one on the left is the sort of classic almond shape, but that the one on the right we're seeing in perspective. So we're seeing it rises up and it, it, it covers away from us quite steeply, okay? And we're seeing the inside of this, there's a, a layer of skin we're seeing there. But the other important thing about the, the perspective of that eye or the eye is that the iris is generally uh, cut across the, the lid of the eye, cuts across the eye iris. So what you're getting is, um, you know, you get your nose. The eye is doing that sort of thing. So it rises up and comes down quickly. You get the thickness of the skin, but the iris is being cut across like that. Um, and then there's the pupil. If you if you um, if you show the eye, hang on, that, and show the the whole iris, it has makes the eye seem very starey. Okay, so the iris is almost always being cut across by the the eyelid. So those are a couple of few things to remember when we're doing the portrait. So we um. I did an example earlier on, and uh, Query wasn't just pleased with that, so I was I'm okay with it. Uh, now, where's my thing gone? There it is. So, I've, the main reason that I, I square up the paper uh, that is to is to transfer the image across. It helps to get a likeness. So, if you're going to do um, portraits from photographs, and if you, and you don't have a huge amount of experience, I would actually one of the things I would suggest is that you don't do too many family members to start off with, because you have a very strong idea of, of what you think their family members look like. And it's very easy to get very disillusioned if it doesn't work out uh, to start off with. So if you're going to start doing portraits, do them of people who you're not, don't feel such a, a connection, such an attachment to, um, and you, you won't have to deal with that idea at least. So what we're going to do is, you know, look at where, uh, you know, bits of the face cut across these lines of, of the quartering. So how, how big is that within the shape? What are the, what are the negative shapes outside her in these faces? So the cheek cut across about there, top of the head about there, back head about there, the jawline about there. So your, your pictures, your, your main face or, or head is kind of within that area there. So I should have said earlier on, this piece of paper, this is an A4 uh, photocopy. This piece of paper is similar to A4. It is 
uh, 21 wide by 29 high. Um, and so that's 10 and a half and 14 and a half for these lines. Um, so you'll end up with something which is similar in size to the, so that's roughly where we are. Now, when I draw, I tend to, or quite often I'll, I'll kind of feel for something, I'll scan about and feel for, for where something is before I make um, definitive, what I call definitive marks. That's, um, that's where the hair is. So the jaw's actually coming up there. Ears cutting across about there. Yeah, I'm doing that sort of thing. You'll need a rubber. So this cheekbone's kind of doing that. Too far out, is it? Maybe not. You can't see very well what I'm doing. Hang on. I will find something. I'm just being harder. So I'm leaning a bit harder than I might normally, just so you can see what I'm doing. Yeah, way too high, way too high. Better. Yeah, it's okay, it's better. Yeah, pushed it too far that way. That's supposed to be there.
even better. Yeah, that's better. Sort of going okay. This this bit of hair that's falling down is only it's not far from the eye. So you get that sort of thing. That's better. better. So the thing about lips, lips are kind of interesting. When you're drawing lips, the, um, nose comes down, goes in, you get that, and you get the top lip doing that. Um, and very often the bottom lip is just is inside that it doesn't doesn't st stick out as far if I do that okay so in and then it's that and then you get the jaw so and if the light's coming down which it almost always is top lip is almost always darker okay because light light tends to come down so bear that in mind when you come to do the the value the, the lightness and darkness um so I'm not going to draw much more so when you get to a stage where you're a uh, relatively happy with what's happening um, and you can you know adjust and play with it as long as you need to but then but rub out those um, reference lines um, so they don't get in the way of when you come to render the light and dark I'm not going to spend a long time doing that um, hang on So when you come to start thinking about uh, lightness and darkness, the, the rendering of the, 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 the shadows of the form, basically of the, uh, of the portrait of the face. So I've deliberately had uh, quite a strong light coming in this side. So you get the, um, that sense of shape um, within the portrait of form. I'm going there and explain. It's okay. A, so what I'll do when I generally what I'll do when I'm when I'm trying to to show the, the shape of something by using uh, light and dark is I'll work in quite quite simple planes, quite simple values, uh, and then get, get more complex as as it goes along. So on this side of the face, whole side of the face, there's a kind of there's there's a shadow, there's a there's a there's a, a darkness on the whole side of the face. So I'll just 
do that. Oops. And not worry too much about how um, how neat it is. Hey, you know, I can rub out and change it as we go. So there's a kind of a shadow on that whole side of the face. So put the simplest one in, simplest value in first. Um, there's, you know, shadow in the eye and side of the nose. Leave it under there. Um, So I'm not thinking about detail at all. I'm not thinking about highlights and eyes or anything like that at this stage. It's sort of simple values that I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, big shapes. So you get some sort of sense of what the portrait is there. Um, so then it's a case of, of adding more, more complexity to the, to the lightness and darkness um, as we go. So there's some in there. As I said, you can rub stuff out. So it's not a particularly detailed portrait. I'm not making a very detailed portrait, partly because uh, of time restrictions. I don't want to spend too long. You can spend a long, long time on these sorts of pencil portraits. And it's really just to get the simple idea of how to start thinking about making a portrait. So like I said, the top lip tends to be darker than the bottom lip. Oh, there's some in that as well also.
Yeah, it's too bad. Not, not, not the best, but it's, um, you kind of get the idea of how to... The most important thing when you're doing something like this is to get the, the basic structure right. After that, you can put in as much detail, spend as much time doing as much detail as you want. So getting those initial relationships right, so using the, 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 the quartering of the, of the surface um, and then looking for the relationships of you know, where, the, where, the, where the head crosses these, these lines, what are the shape, what's the, the shape and what's the negative shape within that? You know, how do these shapes um, reference those shapes, that sort of thing, okay? Uh, so once you've got the, once you can understand how the, how the basic structure is working, you can then play about with the detail for as long as you like. So, yeah, it's okay, it's not the best, but that's a decent way to start thinking about doing a portrait of someone who you have a photograph of. Um, The other thing I'm always reminding people of is that um, although the, the whites of our eyes, we, of our eyes we, we talk about as being white, they're actually not white. They've always got some sort of value on them. There's always a shadow under the eyelid there. And the whites are, are rarely ever quite white. So. There you go, that'll be the same. Um, square up your surface, transfer the basic intersections across, work out the relationships, get rid of the, the cross, and then start adding the, the value, the lightness and darkness, um, simply to start off with. And then you can start getting more complex as you go along. Don't, when you come to the hair, try not to, to start drawing every strand of hair. I, if I don't draw any, any kind of strands at all, I know that's hair because I know that's a face. So you don't need to draw every strand of hair to know that it's hair. You know it's hair because it's sitting on top of a head. It's, it's, the, um, it's, the, it's the relationship, it's the other, other things around something that tell us what it is usually. Anyway. Right, that'll do just now. Uh, I'm going to keep messing about with it. So that's the first portrait. The next one I want to do, and um, we'll just go out to the side, is um, is based on this image here. It's a it's a Picasso drawing of his son, Claude, and it's done by by dipping his his finger in the ink, um, and it's actually a lithograph. Um, in lithographic ink and, and dabbing it on the surface of the lithel stone. Now, I don't want people to get go sticking their fingers in ink. So what I did, or not if they don't want to, um, was make these kind of dabber things, which you can then put in ink and we'll, and we'll work with those. And although I'm not going to make a, a dabbing image like him, we're going we're gonna to use this I, a similar idea. So you got how to make these things. I got some old, um, or I got, I got a kitchen cloth and I just started rolling it up um, into a, like a sausage. Um, some people have these sort of uh, like cotton wool uh, sort of 
so things like that made of cotton wool that you can get, they use those. Um, anything like this that you've got around that, that you might be able to use is fine. So you cut a strip of your, of your cloth or your rag, whatever it is you've got, uh, and roll it up. And I'm, you might want to make a couple of these, a, th a thicker one and a thinner one, depending on what it is you're going to do. Um, there, so you end up with a sort of sausage like that. And then you take a bit of tape and just stick it together. Now, you, you might find that the end of your, um, of this isn't very flush if it's not rolled up uh, perfectly. So just take a pair of scissors and um, chop it off and it'll make it more flush and, and easier to use perhaps. So make a couple of those uh, and we'll start thinking about, about these, this image. Now, I, like I say, I don't want to do just the dabby thing. It's quite hard to make work, um, if, particularly if you don't have a lot of experience of that sort of thing. So what I want to do is work with the, uh, this image of Georgia O'Keeffe. George O'Keeffe is an American artist, uh, mid 20th century American artist, lived in um, New Mexico a lot, uh, between New Mexico and New York. Uh, did beautiful landscapes and, and flower paintings. She, and there are some really nice uh, portraits of her. So I'm gonna do, use this to create something, not like that, but sort of, that was the thing that brought, gave me the idea of working with ink. So I'm gonna put that aside um, and we're gonna think about how to do that. So what I did was I got a, a piece of paper um, put that around. Um, and I put a ground on it. So we're going to work with the ink, but we're all also going to do some reductive drawing on it. So that's taking out. Um, there's a nice, nice chance to make some highlights in this. So, so I put a ground on that. And the way, I, the way I do a ground, for those of you who haven't done it before, take a pencil um, and a graphite ground, a pencil ground. So sharpen your pencil onto the um, bit of paper. Um, get rid of the wood and then take something, uh, an old, well, I've got a cotton wool pad here, and just rub it into the paper. And you'll end up with, you know, you, you um, it goes dark. All right. So that's the ground. So that's, that's how I did that. Start off um, with the same size of paper. It's 29 by 21 with the quarter on it uh, to transfer your image. And then we do exactly that. We transfer the image across uh, the same way as we did the previous one. Um, so find out where, you know, the top with the hat, a really nice dark hat, maybe where it crosses there, there, something like. That sort of thing going on with the hat. Chin. Down about here. Now, the the lines are just a guide. You know, we're not we're not machines. You won't get it exactly right. That's just the way it is. Um, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Like everything in life, most things in life are just practice. Um, I'm not a big one. As those who've been to the classes know, uh, for the whole talent argument. Um, I'm not saying talent doesn't exist, but uh, it's a difficult one to define. Talent's a difficult thing to define. So improve your skills is what I'm saying. So faces on a slight angle, it's not straight on. It's like that a wee bit. So that's the pencil straight up and down, but the nose is at a slight angle. So we'll try to get into account when we do it. So this nostril in here just is just in the, where those two lines meet. It's quite handy. Just look for those sorts of ideas.
And this is going to be, we're going to use the, the sort of the ink, ink to do this. So it's more in the, what, what you call, might call it expressive way of, of rendering a portrait rather than that trying to get the, the um, using the pencil, pencil to, to do the portrait, which tends to um, make us want to focus much more on the, the accuracy. It's more about sort of the, the using the materials in, in an expressive way. So a useful thing to remember when you're looking at doing a, a, a front on portrait is with the eyes, generally speaking, there's about an eye's width between the eyes. Okay, so think of that in a second. So there's about that, that much width between them. So once you've got the sort of main shape of it worked out, so mine's a wee bit too fat, I think. Maybe not. That's better. So once you've done all that, once you're once you're ready, um, if you get rid of the um, these lines, now if you just rub them out, you can take whatever it was you you did the grinding with, and you can bring the ground back in. A lot of it's going to have ink over it anyway, so it doesn't. It's not too um, vital. So 
once you're ready, once you've done all that, and kind of found the, the main um, positions of the features of the face, um, take your ink. So I've got, uh, where's my, there it is. There's ink in a pot. I've got all of these dabbery things that I've made. And rather than, I'll just get a square, square bit of paper. Hang on. There you go. So just take a dabber and, and sort of see what's going to happen. If you, when you first take the ink and put it on, you'll get that. So I'm, you can do that thing that Picasso did in his one uh, to build his. I might use a, a wee bit of that um, in mind, but when you first do it, you'll have a very, it'll be very loaded with ink, the, the dabber. Okay. So you might want to either take a piece of paper like this and, and get rid of the, most of it on, but because she's wearing a, a black hat and dark clothes, you can kind of use that. But what I'm in, more interested in is that kind of mark, that sort of broken um, feeling to the mark. I want to use that quite a lot more than that sort of thing. So this is quite, in, quite, quite thick uh, drawing ink that I've got. It's not thin, uh, watery ink. So you get more of that with that sort of idea. So what I'm going to do is just start off with a hat. Now the, the light's coming from this side. So I might uh, leave the hat a bit more kind of sketchy on this side. And remember you're, you know, you're making a, you're making a drawing and drawings are, are different things from, from photographs. So use the, the, the medium that you're, that you're working with and um, to try, try to use as much of the properties of that medium rather than trying to make the medium fit into some other idea, okay? So there I can make some really nice marks. A wee bit lighter than the other side. Like that. There we go. All the way around. Um, here as well. Oh, that, you see that quite, those marks quite heavily on the screen. They're not so much on my, to me here, but that's okay. We'll, uh, we'll think about that later on. So you've got that darkness going on there. Maybe a, a lighter, more broken mark on this side, like that side of the hat. Neck, there's really nice shadow going on in there. Bring a bit of paper. So you can use the edge of the, the dabbers to, to, to create a line. They do work quite well for that sort of thing. So I'm just using them quite lightly to create these shadows under the chin there, just working out how to do that. There you go. I'll use a smaller one now. I and mean, if you get kind of broken up marks like that, just leave them and see how they work. Don't, don't feel you've got to um, manage everything um, completely. Just see how, see what the, what the materials you're using do, see what they bring to what it is you're, you're making.
Yeah, the only problem is if you if you do get something doesn't doesn't go quite the way you want it to go, it's there. It's really difficult to get rid of, uh, but that's just part of the process. Yeah, it's kind of going okay, I think. So um, you can keep doing that as long as you feel is appropriate. Um, yeah, so not bad. Okay, so I'm just going to give that a quick dry with the hair dryer, and then I'm going to use. So we use the put the ground on to start off, and we'll, and we'll bring up some highlight things. So I'm just going to yeah. you just kind of kind of go got to go slowly it can be quite unforgiving this sort of thing I think that the Picasso one he just kept um ladling more and more in corn. These are not very pleased with that eye, hang on.
Oh, just making it worse. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just, so the light's coming from, from this side. So I'm going to, you know, draw a bit with that. So it's not particularly what we're seeing there, but I'm uh, thought I'd try this and see how it went. A bit severe, maybe, but you can. If it doesn't go quite the way you want to, if you if you do too much, you can just take your cloth that you've put the or the whatever you've made the the ground with, um, and bring some of that back. Yeah. So anyway, you, can, you can keep going with that sort of idea. I'm not going to do any more to it. The, that eye is annoying me. So it's um, an okay use of the, the idea. It's a great photograph of her. But, and actually, I'm going to bring more darkness into this side. Hang on. Oops. Too much. Too much, too much, too much, too much. Uh, too much again, it's lighter there. Um, not always a good idea to keep going, but there you go. So um, that's two, two portraits, one pencil portrait, both used uh, the idea of quartering up your, your paper, um, finding out the dimensions of the face from where the lines cross over, looking at the shape and the negative shape, the relationships, it's all about relationships, um, you know, where things cross over. So try that with pencil portrait um, first, perhaps. I've, I'm just using, in these rooms, I'm just using a, a black and white gray medium media on this. I'm not going into color at all. You might want to do that. Um, you might want to add some watercolor. You can do anything you like to it. But um, and like I said at the start of it, if you're going to do a, portrait of from a photograph and you haven't done many before try not to start out with doing family members um, they can be really unforgiving we have a very strong idea of what family members look like um, and it can be quite discouraging if it doesn't end up meeting our expectation so just do work with um, uh, images if you're going to work from images of people who you're not so engaged with um, or work from life if you can if possible that's the, the best way to, to improve um, but uh, see how you go with that and I will get this onto YouTube and I uh, hope you find it useful. Okay. <laughs>